don't know who I am, I'm Jen Swan, I'm the Associate Director in Art Services. And uh, if you're not familiar with our group, we're a nonprofit. We help other nonprofit arts and culturals. Um, one of the things that we do is uh, trainings, giving out resources. So this is a perfect example of what we do. And um, I just want to let you know, I was handing out some material. So you have a art services brochure. So that gives you an overview of what we do. Um, there's a Buffalo River program card. Uh, that's one of the programs that we do with the Erie Canal Harbor Development Group. And um, we help arts and culturals and other groups get funding to do programming along the Buffalo River. And then the last uh, thing that you have in your hand is a quarter sheet. That's for our fundraiser, which is next week, uh, Wednesday. And um, all of our services that we offer to the field are free. So our fundraiser sort of supplants that and helps us give sessions like these and, and bring trainings and resources. So. Um, I want to introduce Elizabeth Warnhaber. She's our program coordinator, and she'll introduce our speaker for tonight. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, Michael's been kind enough to come and share his wisdom about the Nonprofit Revitalization Act with us. I was lucky enough to see Michael speak at a United Way training and thought that it would be great for him to come and talk to all of you about all of the changes that are going to be coming up on July 1st. Um, so without further ado, Michael's a great Thank you. Hi everybody. Hi. I'm a lawyer. I practice locally. Most of my practice is nonprofit organizations, which is one reason why I go around and speak on this kind of material. Um, but I have clients in all fields, arts, education, health, uh, religion. Uh, but what everyone has in common are the things we're going to talk about tonight, the New York nonprofit laws, under which you're all structured and operated. And then there's tax exemption, but that's not a subject for tonight. Maybe another time. Um, I have material I'll pretty much be following, and this will be available uh, online afterwards, I believe, uh, uploaded to the website, so you can print it out and be able to take notes, though, of course, you're welcome to take notes now. And uh, I'm happy to take questions as we go along. That may help uh, illuminate the material. Now, I know you may have heard about the Revitalization Act already. There's been some material here at ASI presentations about it, but there's continuing questions and concerns about the Revitalization Act. Um, after about 10 years of discussions in Albany about changes to nonprofit laws, and I'll talk a little bit about the gestation process of, of today's amendments, uh, this all seemed to come through in a rush of legislative activity in the spring of 2013, especially some of the governance changes. Um, and I think Maybe that's part of the reason why there are so many questions. Uh, and I'll try to run through those as we go. And if you have questions, and you probably do, uh, I can't promise I'll be able to answer them because some of them are probably going to be questions that a lot of other people have as well. So with that, um, let's get started. Uh, the quick summary of uh, the new act is here. Uh, it does several different things, the, the, the amendments. Um, these amendments, what we're talking about, first of all, is mainly the not-for-profit corporation law. That is the statute in New York under which nonprofit corporations are formed. And if you're an education corp or a religious corp formed under those statutes, the NPCL, as we call it, is the mother statute. So those feed into and cross-reference the not-for-profit corporation law. So these provisions matter to all of you and to many other organizations in the community. And the amendments um, uh, addressed a couple of fundamental facets of the statute. One set of amendments deals with what I call governance, accountability, conflicts of interest, board procedures, that sort of thing. Another set of amendments deal with the structure of corporations. And these are terms probably that uh, you'll recognize when we get into some of the detail. Um, but some of the changes in the statute improve, in, in my view, greatly improve transactions, structure and transactions. And why should that matter to you? Because certainly at the beginning of your corporate life and occasionally during your corporate life, you will encounter these transactions. And with these amendments, those transactions are going to be simpler. That's not where the questions are coming from that I referred to. Questions coming from the nonprofit community are in the governance area. So on the governance side, uh, the, the quick rundown that you've probably already heard about is a new requirement 
that if you are subject to have to file an audit or a review with the Charities Bureau, then you're required to have an audit committee composed of independent directors. These are both new things. It is a new, it's the first time New York law has required a specific committee, the audit committee, and it's the first time to have a definition of an independent director to be on that committee, and we'll talk about that. Now, the statute has always had conflict of interest provisions, and maybe many of you have conflicts of interest policies, because in addition to those original provisions in the statute, for at least 15 years or more, I think, the IRS has asked whether you have conflicts policies when you apply for exemption. So that's nothing new. But what's new in the statute with these amendments is that they totally revamped the conflicts provisions. And they introduced the new concept of the related party transaction. Uh, and then they specifically required, the statute specifically requires that you adopt a conflicts policy, a written conflicts policy that tracks the statute. Uh, before, the statute didn't require that you specifically adopt a conflicts policy. The statute merely had a conflicts section that you had to obey. But now you have to do two things. You have to obey the statute, of course, as you always did. But now you have to have a written policy to reflect that, if you don't already. Um, and then, uh, along the way, those reports, those audits and reviews that I referred to, uh, they raise the thresholds at which those must be filed. And that's a good thing. That means that for the organization in the 100,000 to 250,000 range, uh, it's going to be uh, a little bit easier for you because you're going you're to drop below those thresholds, and that's going to relieve you of the requirement to have a review or audit done by an outside CPA, and that'll save some money because audits and reviews have gotten more expensive, more complicated, more lengthy, uh, and that's become, it did become a recognized burden that the legislature recognized. Uh, there were hearings last spring. Uh, the legislature heard from the community in the hearings that the cost and expense and time of audits was becoming burdensome to the smaller nonprofit. So the thresholds were raised. And as I said, there's been questions from the community, uh, and there are already bills uh, pending to attempt to do something with some of these questions. In fact, there's already been one of those bills enacted. Uh, within the last three weeks or so, a set of technical changes were adopted by the legislature and signed by the governor into law, and one of them that I'll talk about uh, toward the end is anything but technical. It's very fundamental and in a good way, and I'll explain why when we get there. So I'll run through that summary in order, more or less. Let's start with uh, the headline, the one that everyone's talking about, which is the audit changes. As I said, the law requires a new audit committee. And here are the required functions for this new audit committee. It has to first, and this is pretty much a quote, oversee the accounting and financial processes of the organization. That's a broad statement. That means this new body with these new independent directors has a lot of responsibility and authority within the organization, uh, even in arts organizations, maybe especially in arts organizations. Uh, finance is very important. Uh, and now this body of independent folks are the ones that are charged with the legal responsibility to oversee that. But it was, these changes were enacted specifically to focus on the audit if you're required to do one. So therefore, this body also must retain the auditor, uh, work with the auditor in planning the audit, uh, review the results of the audit, etc., evaluate the auditor. Um, some of the duties get more specific as your budget size goes up, but this is basically a summary of the whole thing. And as I said, independent directors, um, I say here that it has to be at least three independent directors because by statute, the, the longstanding requirement is that a committee has to have at least three board members on it. You can't have a committee of two or a committee of one, you must have a committee of three. So that's why I say that you have to find at least three independent directors on your board. Now, the law gives you an alternative. Uh, it doesn't have to be a committee if you have the requisite number of independent directors who could fulfill the function of the committee. So you don't have to call it an audit committee. It could be the, it could be the entire board that acts as a whole if there's enough independent directors to have a vote. 
So if you have 15 directors and only four are independent, you're not going to have a quorum and a majority with only four independent directors. And in situations like that, my recommendations to clients are to, one way or another, take those four and put them on a committee. To the audit committee or not, it doesn't matter, but they need to be in a committee because a committee is empowered to take action. But a board can't act through a minority. A board has to have a quorum and a majority. And uh, no non-directors on the committee. I'm actually surprised how often I'm being asked this question. But a board committee, by definition, is composed of board members. So that audit committee, for example, can't have staff on the committee. Staff can be invited to the committee. Maybe staff should be invited to the, to the committee to present information that the committee needs. But the voting members of that committee are those directors who are independent. And who are independent? There's an extensive definition in the new act. Uh, and it's somewhat controversial. As I said, it's new. And it's also unique. Uh, there isn't this kind of definition elsewhere in New York nonprofit law. And actually, when you really look into it, there also isn't this definition in the IRS rules either. There's a question on the 990 about independent directors, but it's not like this definition. Uh, there's a couple of slides here that, that tease this out, but essentially, the, the real nutshell is that they have to be independent for all purposes. <coughs> no transactions with the corporation directly or indirectly through families or companies that they have a significant role in. But the definition is highly specific. So certainly it means that the director is not employed by the corporation or an affiliate in, within the last three fiscal years. Affiliate is a new definition, a new term and a new definition in the statute. And it, it, the definition is here. It's pretty brief, actually. But it's also a commonly used definition. Uh, not in the sense that it appears in a lot of statutes. I'm not sure that it does. But it's a term that we lawyers commonly use when we talk about affiliates, which means an entity controlled by, in control of, or under common control with the corporation at issue. So in other words, a parent corporation, a brother-sister corporation, or a subsidiary. So the nonprofit that's subject to the policy could be in any one of those spots on the org chart, and that's how affiliate is defined. So if you're the parent, the affiliates are the subs. If you're a sub, the affiliates are your, your fellow brother-sisters and your parent, for example. And it's not just employment, it's also non-employment compensation, like 1099, like independent contractor relationships. Then there's vendors. Uh, so the director must not be a current employee or have a, quote, substantial financial interest in certain vendors. And those vendors are ones that have a significant amount of business with the corporation. This was hotly debated as the bill was working its way through the legislature. Um, I'm on the State Bar Association Corporate Law Committee that was uh, injecting itself into this process. In fact, has been working on this for 10 years. Not this specifically, but, um, you know, nonprofits have lawyers. Lawyers do your filings for you. For 10 years and more, increasingly, our membership in the Bar Association has been encountering all kinds of difficulties in doing your corporate filings for you and all kinds of other nonprofits and all kinds of other fields. And so our committee in the Bar Association responded to that widespread set of concerns and started studying the nonprofit corporate laws in New York about 10 years ago and, st and coordinated with law schools and um, uh, tr other trade groups around the country, um, uh, people that were working on model acts around the country, professors, uh, pri uh, prominent practitioners around the state, and uh, made a series of proposals uh, opened up debate, I think, really on a statewide basis about the nature of nonprofit organizations. Some of the things we talked about are in these new amendments, and some of the things we wanted and talked about are not in these amendments. And time permitting, I'll be touching on, on both sets of those things. But this was one of the things that became hotly discussed in that process that my bar association participated in. And that was, how broad should this independent definition be? Uh, this is a fairly high bar, I think. Uh, it's not going to be every vendor that is, it receives or is being paid the lesser of $25,000 uh, or 2% of their gross revenues solely with your organization. 
but it's possible. Um, and it's not every organization where the director is going to be a current employee or have a substantial financial interest in that vendor. So the thinking is that this was a compromise. And when I say the thinking, the original part of this definition in the bill originally written by the Attorney General was much broader than that and would have reached many more people. And the response that we and others in the nonprofit community had was that that was going to make it awfully difficult, especially in small and medium-sized areas, to find independent directors. You know, there were examples like, you know, if your uh, a child was a meter reader for National Fuel and that was the utility supplier to the organization, that would render you not independent. And obviously this became ridiculous as we started spinning out these hypotheticals. The response was to tinker with the definition like this. And the term substantial financial interest is not defined, so we don't really know what that means. Does that mean a senior manager with a hefty salary in the vendor, or does it mean someone with an ownership interest in the vendor, or something like that? We don't know. Because I would add, there isn't guidance yet on the new statute from the Charities Bureau. Relatives of directors are also covered within the scope. So when you're determining whether a director is independent, you also have to vet the relatives of the director. And it's actually a common definition that we have here. This is actually almost identical to the IRS definition. Certainly spouses and domestic partners under New York law, ancestors, meaning the vertical relationship, parents, grandparents, siblings, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and their spouses. Uh, but not nieces and nephews, so there's, there's only so far it goes horizontally. And as I said, that's the same as the definition for the purpose of the IRS rules. And in case you don't immediately know, the IRS rules I'm talking about are the so-called excess benefit IRS rules. They were, an, uh, they're in response to originally a, an amendment to the Internal Revenue Code in the 1990s that enacted new standards for evaluating compensation in nonprofits, in 501c3s and c4s specifically, and most arts organizations are c3s. And then there were regulations that came out in the years after that statute was enacted. Those regulations took their current final form a little more than 10 years ago. So they're pretty well settled regulations and principles. And so this relative definition was drawn from that. And so there's a test for the relative's relationship. It's a little bit different from the test for directors. So the test for relatives is a little bit higher in some ways. It's not whether they're a current employee of any kind, but whether they're a key employee uh, of the corporation or affiliate, and, or whether they were paid a certain amount in compensation other than as uh, a key employee, like a contractor. With respect to those third-party vendors, it's whether they're a current officer of the vendor and don't have a substantial financial interest, whatever that means. It's a little bit higher bar than it is when you're applying that same test to the director. I mean, how are you going to do all this? I don't know. I mean, this people like me are struggling with what we advise you guys. Do we draft extensive questionnaires and, you know, at risk intruding on the private lives of your directors and officers? I don't know. I haven't seen people write those questionnaires yet, but the practical reality is that you have to make these determinations. What I'm doing with clients is beefing up the conflicts policy, incorporating these definitions as clearly as possible, and hoping that you can work with your directors in the annual certification process to lay this out before them and let them volunteer the information, hopefully. Um, and so we'll just see how that works in practice, if there's going to be things that slip through the cracks or not. These are the changes I mentioned on the reporting thresholds. So here are the dollar amounts specifically. You probably know that the current dollar amounts are that if you have 100,000 in gross revenues, you have to have reviewed financial statements filed with the Charities Bureau. And if you have 250,000 in gross revenues, it's an audit you must file. Everything goes up on July 1. The review level goes up to 250,000 permanently and stays there. The audit threshold goes up in stages to 500,000 on July 1 and then 750 in 2017, and a million dollars in 2021. And I have to say, that's putting New York in the front rank. I think California has a similar scheme of this fairly high level before triggering audits. I also have to say there was pushback to this. Uh, my bar association was advocating for this actually for some time. 
and it didn't get any traction, and I'm not claiming credit for it, but it didn't get any traction until hearings, to, at least to my perception, it didn't get traction until hearings were held last spring in Albany, and the questions started emerging, and people started talking about the burdens and costs and hassles of audits and reviews for small organizations, and so it emerged in the bill, and personally, I think it's a good thing. I have large clients, I have small clients, I work with lots of accountants, uh, I speak at accounting seminars like this as well, so I hear other accountants talking about the same subject. And I dare say that a lot of accountants realize the burdens of the audit for the small organization. They realize the difficulties in having you have the necessary books and records, whether it's QuickBooks or whatever, instilling the kinds of procedures in your operation that will yield a good audit. So the accountants, too, have sympathy for the situation. So therefore, as an overall matter, I think these changes are good for society. But there, was, there were opinions expressed that this will lessen trust and accountability. That if it's going to be so, organizations that are going to be able to have six figures of annual revenues without having to do an audit, people are wondering whether funders will have trust that you are operated in a transparent and accountable manner. And I think the jury is out. We don't know how that will play out. Um, I've heard rumors that some funders are going to still insist on audits and reviews as a condition of funding at lower levels, notwithstanding the change in law. At the same time, I also know of organizations that believe in doing audits for the sake of the trust that it instills in the community, even if they might not have to under the new levels. So the opinions are all over the place on this, but it's, it's in other words, it's not black and white. Any questions so far? We're really going through this material. Okay, related party transactions. Uh, the new scheme that takes over from, um, from the existing conflict scheme. Um, what they did is to find a new idea, the related party transaction. And um, the statute also says that when you have a related party transaction, it has to be approved by the board and specifically by independent directors. So it's not just the audit now, it's also the conference policy that independent directors must oversee. So the first thing they do is define what a related party is, which is rather straightforward, directors, officers, or, and this is the new part, and not as much of a straightforward part, a key employee of the corporation and their relatives. Now, key employee is actually drawn from an IRS regulation. Actually, it's more than that. It's not drawn from the IRS regulation. It is the IRS regulation. The statute just says key employee has the meaning in section such and such of the IRS regulations. So that definition is what I summarize here, which uh, is any person in a position to exercise substantial influence over the corporation. That's IRS language. Now, when you really go back to the IRS language, uh, you know, you might be a little surprised because the term, it, the IRS doesn't use the term key employee, the IRS uses the term person with substantial influence because the IRS regulation covers more than employees. So it's somewhat misleading for the statute to use the term key employee when in fact the regulation cited covers more than employees. Theoretically, substantial contributors are persons with substantial influence and therefore key employees under this related party transaction. Uh, so this has already a broader scope than, than you might think just from looking on the face of the statute. Uh, and that last item, uh, entity in which a person has a 35% or greater interest, that's pretty simple. It's the same under the IRS regs. It's basically getting at persons who have a significant ownership interest in vendors that may be doing business. And certainly, if you own 35% of the stock or more of a business entity that's doing business, you're a pretty important person in that vendor. So it is somewhat appropriate and sensible that that's part of the definition of who's a related party. Uh, so finally, the transaction itself. The rela a related party transaction is any transaction, agreement, or other arrangement, first of all, between the corporation or affiliate that we're talking about and a third party, and in which a related party has a financial interest. Now, 
on reading this closely, I realized, um, uh, not me alone, other people started realizing that they dropped something out of the old statute. The old statute, or the one that is currently in effect for another two weeks, applies to any transaction between two corporations where you may have a director or officer in common, but not necessarily where the director or officer has a financial interest, him or herself, in that transaction. But that's what the new related party transaction says, literally. Where the, direct, where the related party has a financial interest in the transaction at issue. So uh, what could it be? Maybe a sales commission arrangement on the sale of goods from a third party vendor to the nonprofit that the sales person happens to be on the board of? That would be a financial interest in a transaction between the corporation and the third party. Um, and so a conflict that wouldn't be covered by the new definition is say two nonprofits who are collaborating and entering their transactions with each other and they have a director in common. Well, that's no longer a conflict of interest on the face of the statute. And I have to say, speaking for myself and the clients that I work with, I talk about this with each one for whom I review conflicts policies. And I say, look, this is what the new statute says. This is what the new statute dropped. Do you want to preserve the old standard as well as comply with the new standard? Or do you prefer to take the view that if the statute doesn't require it, I'm not going to do it? And my personal point of view, and maybe I'm a little conservative in this, legally speaking, is that the old definition is common sense. People commonly think of that kind of relationship as a conflict relationship. So I personally think it makes sense to incorporate the old standard into the new standard and comply with both. But reasonable people could differ on this, and I certainly respect that. So the process you go through when you have a related party transaction. As I said, independent directors, whether it's the full board or a committee appointed for that purpose, have to review and approve the, the, the transaction. Same as current law, has to be reviewed and approved. There's a standard fairly specifically laid out. It has to be fair and reasonable and in the best interest of the corporation. I love how some people just, and my, my profession particularly has a problem with this, keep on adding words. It's like one word's not enough. Two words are not enough, three words are better, and maybe four or five would be even better. And, and this is kind of an example to, for that. Fair and reasonable and in the best interests. But joking aside, this gives the Attorney General plenty to shoot at if the Attorney General had a mind to challenge a transaction. And that part worries me. Uh, if the related party's interest is a substantial financial interest, then an additional requirement is triggered that you have to look at alternative transactions as well. And that's not defined, so it raises questions such as, is this a de facto bidding requirement, for example? Do you have to get a minimum of three bids? Do they have to be in writing? Do you have to publicize it, put out RFPs, things like that? No answers to any of those questions, what that means. Uh, in a common sense way, really, you have to document the basis for the approval. Uh, that almost goes without saying, but it's certainly sound uh, uh, advice and, and a sound requirement. And equally soundly, the related party should not participate in the review of the pro actually cannot, is prohibited from participating in the review and discussion and approval of the process, except, of course, to provide information to the body that's reviewing it. And really, what we've just gone through is pretty similar to those parallel IRS regs, the excess benefit regs. Uh, the language about fair, reasonable, and best interest is not that parallel to the IRS. Uh, but overall, largely speaking, this is pretty similar and parallel. So if you've put into place procedures to deal with the IRS regs, you're probably in fairly good shape under the, the new statute here in New York. And actually, the whole notion of the related party transaction, that is exactly what the IRS excess benefit regs get at. Those regs are aimed at transactions where your director or officer or related party, you know, relative, spouse, etc., is gaining a financial interest, some economic benefit from dealings with your corporation. And so the New York statute, this related party transaction, is exactly conceptually parallel to that IRS approach. That's probably why it took the shape it did. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, the Attorney General very much was the author of these concepts and this language in this part of the, the amendments. And I think that was very much in their mind, I have to say, speaking personally from my dealings in this process. 
Uh, I alluded darkly to the Attorney General powers a moment ago. Here they are. They are very broad. Um, the Attorney General can go to court to get all kinds of dire things uh, if a transaction violates the statute. And violate could be anything. Violate could be that you didn't authorize the transaction when it happened. Even if after the fact you scramble to try to ratify it afterwards, technically speaking you would have violated the statute by not authorizing it at the time it was arising. And the AG can void the transaction. Void is one of those words that has a very distinct legal meaning. Void means that not, you're not just terminating the transaction, you are making it as if the transaction never existed. That can have profound consequences. Uh, and so, you know, lawyers worry about language like that when that's being handed to the AG uh, with such a large target to shoot at. Because the AG can um, go to court if, um, if the AG can, remember that saying I referred back to, that it was fair and reasonable and in the best interest? So the AG, the way I've put it when I talk about it in other venues is that I say, it gives the AG a free run at your decisions. Or to put it in other words, it can cause you to question how reliable your decisions are going to be, how well they will hold up, how much deference will a judge, let alone the Attorney General, give to the processes your boards went through if the AG gets to go back to square one and second guess everything through a court action. And I'm not trying to sound alarmist, but I think in many other fields, uh, in the healthcare fraud and abuse field, in the securities law field in New York, we've seen the Attorney General actually take extraordinarily aggressive action. So I do not think it is at all unfair to worry about how this power will be administered in the not-for-profit context. Now, in contrast, the way the IRS rules work is that the IRS says that transactions have to be essentially fair and reasonable. I forget the exact language. But you always have the opportunity to make that showing. The IRS regs are structured to encourage you to do that up front. Uh, so they lay out the processes, they recommend, the, the, the regulation lays out the elements that a board should go through in approving transactions under the IRS rules. And if you do those things, the IRS rules give a certain amount of deference, a certain amount of credit to that process and that decision. But even if you didn't do that, the way the IRS rules work, you can still demonstrate, say that an auditor finds a transaction that the board didn't approve. Under the IRS approach, you can still step forward, gather the documentation that shows the transaction was in fact reasonable, and then ultimately you'd be okay under the IRS rules. But that's not how it would work under the New York rules. Under the New York rules, uh, the AG gets to go to court. I mean, he will. I'm not saying he would. I'm not saying it's automatic. But the AG would have the power to say, doesn't matter. If you didn't approve it at the time, you're out of luck, and so we're going to do something about this. That could happen. It's written that way. As I said, in other fields, we've seen the AG exercise a lot of authority and aggressiveness. So I think it is fair to ask how this will be administered in New York. And it's, and it's a, a contrast and a departure for how it, the parallel provisions work under federal law. So what should we be doing? Um, clearly, I think it is, from what I've already said, you know that I'm recommending that you review your conflicts policies and make sure they're consistent with the new statute. It is a requirement. You must have a written policy. If you don't already have one, adopt one. If you do have one, review it to see if it complies with the new statute. July 1 is the deadline for, for you to do this. If you don't do it by July 1, do you die? Well, no, but do it. Um, and you'll see uh, in the con there is a provision that lays out what has to be in the conference policy in these amendments, and you'll recognize it. It, it seems pretty sensible, and one of them that you've probably seen is that every year you expect your directors to write something that says, I certify that I'm not aware of any conflicts, etc., etc., or if there are, here they are, I'm disclosing them at this time. And so therefore, when you update your policy, you know, circulate it, and then collect those certifications under these new standards. And then follow through, you know, identify who are related parties, track that. Uh, there's an ongoing responsibility of your directors and officers to step forward when a transaction arises that may need review. It's not just a once a year thing necessarily. And so have those procedures and follow through on them going forward. Whistleblower policy was also thrown in while they were at it. Uh, so you've probably heard a lot about it. 
Now, whistleblower policies have been around actually for a long time, ever since what you might have heard of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of the early 2000s that required whistleblower policies, actually for everybody. No, what it did precisely was uh, require that whistleblowers not be retaliated against. And so since that statute applied broadly, even to nonprofits, not, not by name, but by the breadth of how it was written, uh, a lot of nonprofits over the years have been adopting whistleblower policies. And what's in our statute is not controversial at all to my eyes in the way that some of these other things are controversial. But at least uh, with this requirement, they're limiting it to the larger organization, 20 more employees and a million or more in revenues. But of course, in your field, perhaps, you already know about the Grants Gateway, and if, you've, if you're in that, you know that there's a long list of policies that New York State, through the Gateway, wants to see that you adopt, and I believe this is one of them. But to have a whistleblower policy in general versus having one that follows these standards is maybe a little bit different, but probably not that different. Governance changes I mentioned also, so it's not just uh, conflicts and policies and things like that, but it's now actually some of how you do business. And so they added provisions to, frankly, probably ratify what you guys have been doing all along anyway, which is sending board meeting notices by email, perhaps collecting board consents by email. So now the statute expressly sanctions those practices by adding electronic mail to those sections about those specific kinds of documents. Now I have to say that um, I believe we always had that power, both under New York law, which is the state technology law specifically, actually a little known statute that broadly authorizes electronic signatures and electronic documents, as well as the um, federal act, the Electronic Signatures in Global and National Commerce. But the way the new statute is written, it says that if you're going to do those board notices, etc., by electronic means, it has to be by electronic mail. And some organizations do it in other ways. There are other means of transmitting electronic documents. And I had nonprofit clients that use other means besides electronic mail. And so I've been advising them, hey, after July 1, it's only electronic mail that you can use for those things. You know, it's, it's the cloud. It's being able to upload electronic documents and share them via the cloud. You can't do that for these documents under this statute because now this statute limited that electronic transmission to electronic mail. Now I have to say, some lawyers thought you could not do anything electronically under the not-for-profit corporation law. So they think that this is broadening what is permitted. And frankly, like you hear maybe if you go to enough legal seminars, reasonable lawyers may disagree. Well, this is one of those areas. Reasonable lawyers may disagree. I may think that, that we had broader authority, but other people would disagree with me, and that's okay too. I think I'm right, but I, I respect other people's uh, legal analysis and opinions if they think there's something wrong with how I uh, approach this. And they also threw in video conferencing to the long-standing provisions that permit you to hold board meetings by telephone conference. Personally, I didn't think we needed that because the way that the phone conference language was written just referred to people being able to hear each other and speak. And that occurs in a video conference. So I thought we always had the ability to do Skype for board meetings. But now we have express authority to use Skype as well. So, you know, check your bylaws because you want to make sure your new provisions are consistent with this. Maybe you referenced email and such in your bylaws. Maybe you didn't. But now that we have fairly specific requirements on these points, make sure that your bylaws are consistent with the statute. Otherwise, you might inadvertently use something incorrect that doesn't comply with the new statute. Why does that matter? Well, we're talking about corporate governance. We're talking about how you take board action. If you take board action that isn't valid, the, the action is challengeable. I see this arise in corporate disputes. Board disputes between people that disagree, maybe members are making complaints about how management is conducted. You don't need to distract from the dissension that might or may not already exist by handing excuses for actions to be attacked because you followed an incorrect procedure. It's not that hard to, to revise your bylaws to be compliant, so it's useful and sound corporate practice to, to do that. But of course, I'm a corporate lawyer. What else would I say? Committees were tinkered with. Everyone's been talking about this as if it's dramatic. I actually don't think it's that dramatic. 
Um, the existing statute, I think in fairness, was confusing. There's references to standing committees and special committees in the existing statute. There are references to the president appointing committee members subject to the consent of the board. Uh, it wasn't entirely clear to some people whether those committees had to be board only or could have non-board members on them. So really, the new committee section, to my eyes, simplifies those provisions. So now you just have board committees or the long-standing, but not well-known, committee of the corporation, which is simply the term used to refer to committees that don't have board members on them, like maybe your fundraising committee, or your building and grounds committee, or your nominations committee. It could be any committee that you bring in people from outside the board to populate, you know, volunteers who support you. That would be, technically speaking, a committee of the corporation, even though I don't see hardly anybody actually using that term. Though they did tinker with the committee of the corporation to say that it can't bind the board, and I'm not sure what's meant by that, because mm -hmm. bind is a contract law term, and these aren't contractual relationships, so I think Maybe they, they're muddying the waters a bit there. Oh, and uh, I mentioned that bit about the president appointing members subject to the board consent. They just took that out. I think that's probably a good thing because that tended to cause confusion. Um, but if you think about it, it was the same net result because the president could appoint subject to board approval. Well, it was still a board process. So I think it's a useful simplification to say that the board has to establish the committee because that was, in fact, what was going on. That doesn't mean the president can't nominate. Uh, the statute doesn't prohibit the president from nominating, and it's really probably pretty close, frankly, to, to, to the same thing, uh, just that the language is now simpler and, I think, easier to understand. So while you're in your bylaws, review your committee provisions. This is a change that doesn't take effect July 1. It takes effect in 2015. Um, but there's already a bill to repeal it, and from people I talk to, it seems to be favored to pass. Uh, there's a bunch of other bills out there too, but I don't see them moving very much on some of these other issues. There are bills to, to postpone all these effective dates, um, but I'm not hearing that those are moving. I, I do hear that this one is moving, so we may wind up with um, a return to current law, which doesn't prohibit employees from being board chairs. Uh, why does this matter? I'm not sure. <laughs> this must sound silly. I keep saying things like that. But that's, that's, the nature of, that's the nature of a bill that resulted from so many cooks in the kitchen, the State Bar Vision Commission, the State Attorney General, the State Bar Association, and all kinds of other groups weighing in on this process. So that's one reason why I think we have odd little provisions. And this one was one of those that snuck in there. And I, I know that the rationale behind the prohibition was, was a notion of good governance. That you have what we sometimes call the executive director dominated board, where the executive director seemingly handpicks the board and they rubber stamp her decisions, that kind of thing. And this was seen as one way to try to inhibit that kind of organization. Uh, but then we started hearing stories, well, you know, in, in ecclesiastical law, it's pretty important in some church systems that the pastor be, uh, be chairing some of these bodies. So there started to be some pushback. And so apparently uh, we may get that uh, unwound uh, by next January. Myself, I'm ambivalent about it. I think that good governance is a, a significant issue and a valid issue. And I think that provisions like this um, are logical. Uh, whether we have to mandate that, I don't know, but it, there's a bat, th this is a good and strong reason to take seriously on things like this. Did you have a question? Um, <coughs> there, uh, one of the, uh, as I said, many bills are, are out there already, um, and I don't always talk about all the bills that are out there because tons of bills get proposed and most of them never ever go anywhere. But one recommendation I saw somewhere was to permit committees to be composed of fewer than three directors. I mentioned earlier the standard is three. I actually myself think that's not a good idea because the, the very idea of a committee is that is a, a subset of the board that has certain narrow delegated authority from the board. And I think as a matter of good governance, three is a magic number. Three is uneven. 
three is more than a couple of people that may collude unduly. Uh, so it's a good minimum number, in my view, to have, for lack of a better term, good corporate democracy occurring. So to suggest that you could have a committee of just two or one, I think starts to erode that intangible value of good governance. I mentioned transactions at the, at the beginning, uh, so I'll start to run through the transactional changes here. The first one is actually a little known requirement in current law, which is that every real estate transaction, no matter how small, by a nonprofit under current law, has to be approved by a two-thirds board majority. In fact, it's a board majority of the entire board, which is a magic term, which means counting vacancies. So if your bylaws authorize 21 board seats but only 15 people were in office, you'd have to get a majority of 21, not a majority of 15, in order to have a majority of your entire board. And to have that apply to every real estate transaction, every lease of spare office space in your building, was pretty onerous and was ignored in the majority of cases, I dare say. And so the Bar Association, basically our question to the, to the community was, what is so magic about real estate? Why are we elevating real estate above all other transactions for this? So we suggested repeal of the provision, frankly. But, you know, knee-jerk reaction being what it is, the, to mix metaphors, they cut the baby in half and converted the voting requirement to a majority vote unless it's a large board or it's substantially all the assets. Uh, they retain the entire board requirement, but I don't think I have it in here. They change the definition of entire board. So remember I used the example, if the bylaws say you have a board of 21, that's entire board, even if you have vacancies. Well, the new definition of entire board is whatever the size of the board was that was put into place at your last election. So same example, you have a a bylaw that authorizes, say, a range of 11 to 21 directors. That's pretty common, actually, to have a range. And so, entire board today means 21, even though it says range. Under the new rule, entire board means at your last election you elected 15. So, more than 11, less than 21, you set your current board at 15. So, under the new statute, 15 is the new magic term for entire board. So say your election was last January, and you elected 15 people, that's your entire board. So if you have to hold a vote in June on a transaction, and you've had a couple of vacancies since the 15, you're down to 13, well, you guys still have to have a majority of 15. But at least it's not a majority of 21. I guess that's the cutting baby in half kind of thing that I'm talking about. Really confusing, huh? I'm seeing puzzled looks here. Yes? My question is, we've got some people that sit on our board that are under these terms would not be independent directors. Mm -hmm. So, but they sit in a board seat. So, they automatically disqualified from voting? Yeah, well, that has nothing to do with real estate. There's no independent director requirement. This is strictly the real estate? This is strictly the real, this is strictly the entire board definition as well as the real estate definition. Because the entire board phrase pops up for various voting things throughout the statute. This is one of them. So I'm talking about two changes here. One change is what we changed to the real estate requirement, and the second change is how they tinkered with the entire board definition, which pops up elsewhere, but not independent. Yeah. Yes? So this entire board, the, the majority has to be 15, you said, majority of 15. In my example. That right. doesn't necessarily apply to real estate, it applies to other issues as well? Yeah, there are other things in the statute that require a certain vote of the entire board. The statute, meaning the state The not-for-profit corporation law, right. And sometimes your bylaws use that language as well. Your bylaws might say, you often see this in the slash section of the bylaws amendment. These bylaws may be amended by a vote of two-thirds of the entire board. If your bylaws actually said that, you'd be talking about what I just said. Okay, so is there a way I can easily look up to see what, what these other issues are? You could do a word search for entire board in the online statute, maybe. Okay. Yes? Uh, we have uh, honorary board members that uh, we identify as non-voting. So would they, may we exclude them under this new law or not? That's a great question, honorary directors, because they've been around for a long time and I've written bylaws that have honorary directors in them. There is nothing in the statute about honorary directors, special advisors, directors emeritus, nothing in the statute on them. 
So what are they? When I write those provisions for clients, I, I try to make extraordinarily clear in the bylaws that these are not directors, they don't have fiduciary duties, they don't get notices of meetings, they can be invited, they can volunteer information if they want to. I try to make it as clear as possible, if the client insists on having them, that they are not directors. So therefore, when it comes to this, the board is still those 15 people we talked about, not the extra three or four who have emeritus or honorary or whatever other titles you gave them. They're not counted. In my, that's my Even advice to clients. Even though are directors, they're just honorary directors. Well, my suggestion is that they're not directors. So just take out director and their designation? That's what I started doing a few years ago. My standard bylaws used to have an honorary director provision. I started dropping that because I thought it was becoming too confusing. And because over the past 10 years especially, you've had this drumbeat of publicity about the directors. Where were the directors in this scandal that occurred? Why, why aren't the directors looking at the annual financial report? You know, are the directors aware of what's going on with the staff? So I began to realize that there's more and more public focus on directors, therefore there's going to be more and more confusion about who has what responsibility. So what do you call that person that, that just wants the little label, but is, I mean, I, I've never even met they're they're irrelevant to board decision making, but they are. So what would you call? Them? What, what would the alternative? I can't level? say I've come up with any, any great solution. Great in in my to... standard bylaws, <laughs> I have a section called special advisors, and that was the best I could come up with as a generic matter because advisor sounds important and special sounds even more important. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe that's too generic and too antiseptic. I don't know. But just but you would say take the right direction. That is what I do, yes. I, I, I try not to impose these judgments on people, though, because some of the, th this is intangible. This is in the level of gray area and reasonable judgment. And so I try not to be doctrinaire about this with people. I may sound conservative in corporate law terms, but I actually try to, to not be uh, too much of a, a, a stickler about things that, in the big picture, may not matter all that much. Thank you. So that's the, the, real, the odd, little-known real estate voting requirement. Then there's the transactions that require court approval. They've been around since the statute was written in 69, and it's, it's what you would traditionally expect. It's the sale of all your assets, it's a merger, it's a consolidation, which is a kind of merger, it's a, your corporate purpose amendment when you change your purpose clause, your mission, and dissolution. And all of those operated in the same way. You had to get, if you're a charitable, you had to get court approval upon notice to the Attorney General. But the Attorney General always looked at this stuff closely, sometimes had questions and concerns, sometimes not. And then once you satisfied the Attorney General, you went to the judge, you got your signature, and you were done. The whole process took weeks, maybe a few months in tricky cases, but it was never that difficult. Um, but downstate, there were a lot of complaints. Uh, the court systems in New York City, by all reports, are very clogged. So this became a very inefficient process. Uh, in recent years, the Attorney General occasionally would, would intervene in some of these processes through the, the notice authority that he has under the statute and seek to impose conditions on transactions. Sometimes those were acceptable, sometimes they were fairly speaking in the public interest, that's what the Attorney General is there for, af after all, to look out for the public interest when it comes to charitable dollars. That's something I totally respect. But sometimes uh, practitioners like me thought that the Attorney General was overly applying, over-interpreting some of the legal principles that he claimed to be following. And we would disagree professionally and respectfully with some of these issues, and it affected our clients. I mean, it affected where assets went, or what your purpose clause might look like, or things like that. So. Uh, so this became less uniform and less easy to deal with for different reasons in different parts of the state. And that was a subject of discussion for you know, all these 10 years that my state bar association was talking about transactions. Transactions like this were of great concern because um, other states don't have these requirements. And in the last 10 years or maybe a little bit more, it has actually become more common to form nonprofits in other states primarily Delaware, which frankly, like in the business world, is a very go-to destination to form corporations. It's the number one uh, jurisdiction to form business corporations in, in this country by a magnitude of order.
by an order of magnitude, I should say. Uh, nonprofit lawyers eventually began to notice that, and so we started doing the same thing for nonprofit. It has a very flexible, very sound, very simple corporate statute, and, and also a sophisticated corporate statute with an expert judiciary that interprets it in a consistent and predictable and pretty stable way. Plus, it doesn't have some of these odd provisions like court approval of transactions. I have to say that uh, some people think nonprofits shouldn't do that. Uh, that somehow, if you're a nonprofit, you should incorporate under your own state's law. I honestly don't know where that comes from. Uh, I don't understand that impulse. But uh, I'm a corporate lawyer. My, my ethical duty is to advise clients on uh, the, the pros and cons of the options legally available to the corporation. Just like an accountant's duty is to maximize your deductions, there's no shame in that. My obligation is to maximize the effectiveness of your corporate vehicles that I create for you. And this is one of those. This is New York versus other states. So anyway, uh, so this transaction is sort of unique to New York, this, this, these approval requirements. And these are simplified somewhat now. So now it's either or. You can go just to the Attorney General for approval and skip the court step. Um, because downstate, that'll have a big improvement given the court system. And actually, I have to say, upstate, that may be a help as well. You know, it used to be that I would literally have my papers delivered to the judge in the morning and get them back in the afternoon. It was literally a wire basket in most judges' uh, offices, and the, the incoming papers would go into the, of a certain kind of uh, procedure, that is, uh, where you're not starting a formal action. So the papers would go in the wire basket in the morning, usually get signed over lunch by the judge, because if the judge saw the Attorney General's approval and sign off and there were no adverse parties to object, you know, the judge could easily sign it and then I would pick it up in the afternoon. But today we improved things and we have electronic filing, so now I can't do the wire basket. I have to electronically submit my documents. They go into a central computer of some sort and get farmed out to some judge I don't even know, and eventually, in a few weeks, the judge or her clerk contacts me with a question, or the order just shows up in the mail eventually. So now we no longer have control over the timing of the court process like we used to. So now we add on a few weeks of time for the court part, in addition to the few weeks of time for the attorney general part. And so now it's not as efficient as it used to be. But this at least is saying you can do just one of those. You don't have to do both. Actually, if you choose to go to court, you still have to do it on notice to the AG. Yes? When you speak about the amendment to the purposes, and I think about how many times mission statements are adjusted, uh, and they may be modified in terms of articulating a particular audience that you want to, to attract, does that qualify as, a, as, a, as a, something that needs to go to a court now? Yes, it, al it always has. An amendment of your purpose clause, if you're a charitable corporation, always required court approval upon notice to the Attorney General. And if you also had to get the consent of the education department when you formed your organization, which is likely in the arts world, you'd also have to get the consent of the state education department, at least if you're changing the language that they had consented to. Like you might have a four paragraph purpose clause and one paragraph had education language in it. So education would have had to have consented to that paragraph. So if you change that paragraph, you have to get their consent as well. So there may be a difference between purpose clause and mission. No. No, mission is not a legal term. It's the term that, that, that management uses to because it's an understandable everyday term for the community. The legal, the legal statement is purpose. A purpose clause is those uh, sometimes awkward paragraphs in the certificate of incorporation where we borrow IRS terms, we borrow state law terms, we use some terms that you guys give us, and we come up with this amalgam of language that makes nobody happy. But at least as a lawyer, I know it is legally sufficient to give you the broadest tax exemption I can get for you. What has happened in New York over the decades is that the Department of State, where these instruments are filed, would actually reject a majority of them. They, they actually told us that once in part of these long discussions we had. For all kinds of reasons, technical and not technical, good and not good, but one of them was the purpose clause. And frequently, the Department of State wanted the purpose clause to be more specific, more specific. And as a matter of drafting, the more specific you make your purpose clause, think about it. This is writing. I was an English major. Think about writing a, a, any kind of document. The more specific you make it, actually, the narrower you make it. 
So if you say, you know, you want to promote the arts, that's great, that's broad. But what if is, you know, what if they're making you say, we're, we're going to operate a theater in the inner city? I mean, you get, the more specific you get, the narrower you've made. If you're operating a theater in the inner city, that's not a theater in the suburbs. And it's also not, not a gallery, it's just a theater. And there were other things that cropped up in these processes. And actually, arts is a poster child for one of the most common problems, which was, I'll get to that, we well, might as well get to it now. One of the things we have in New York, I wonder if I have it, here's the slide on agency consents that I just referred to when I referred to education. This is another unique New York requirement that if you had certain language in your purpose clause that implicated a long list of agencies, you'd have to get that agency's consent. Unique to New York, and education was far and away the most commonly required consent, generally, as well as for the arts field. With education, that's been simplified now to just notice to the education department instead of prior consent. That saves a lot of time because education once told some of us that they were getting 300 a month of these requests for organizations that weren't even subject to their jurisdiction. But because of the language of education, the Department of State believed that education needed to consent to it. And it was time consuming. Burdensome on education department, time consuming for you, and frustrating for everybody. So now that's been simplified to after the fact notice. So no longer are we going to tie up time, effort, and staff. We just shoot a copy of the filing afterwards. Here's what I wanted to get to when I was talking about purpose amendments. Another unique thing in New York was this confusing four-type system, A, B, C, and D. Uh, B is what all you charitables are. Uh, a is pretty common and well understood, social clubs, trade associations, civic organizations. C was an odd category, and D was an even narrower category for specialized kinds of entities. C created a lot of problems, actually, increasingly. And you guys were the poster child for that, because the, one of the most common examples and complaints we heard from practitioners in the Bar Association, and that I've encountered as well in my practice, was that when the Department of State saw something like a nonprofit theater, and the Department of State was pushing you to be more specific in your purpose clause, and then when you came out and wrote to operate a theater, then the Department of State would say, oh, well, in that case, since businesses operate theaters, since there are for-profit theaters, and you said in your purpose clause, you're going to operate a theater, well then, you're a type C, which means something that has a lawful business purpose for a lawful public objective. Now, so what? I just said that like it's some big deal. Is it, why is that such a big deal? Well, we lawyers and accountants look at the words lawful business purpose, then we look at the law of charity and 501c3 that says you're not doing business, you're doing charity, and we worry that someone somewhere along the line will take the position that we're not entitled to exemption anymore because we have a business purpose. Now this frankly is the result of a, a, a badly thought out statute that invented this concept in the first place and B, in my view, an overly aggressive application of those provisions by the Department of State. But the consequences and risk fell on you guys because some of you were forced into the Type C category, which made people like me worry about how vulnerable you might be to an exemption challenge. Now, having said all that, like it's such a horrible thing, I have a bunch of clients that are Type Cs, including the theater, and, uh, and I've gotten exemption for them, and the IRS never even asked me questions about it. But you see, you want certainty when you go to a lawyer and accountant about how you're set up. You don't want lawyers and accountants telling you, well, there's some gray area here, we don't know if this will come up. Uh, we want certainty, too, when we set these things up, and this was fraught with uncertainty, as far as I'm concerned, so now I'm delighted that it is gone. Now we just have two types. You're either charitable or you're non-charitable, and the really, frankly, not useful Type C language is gone. You know, we've gone like an hour. Uh, I'm sorry to keep hold people up. You know, this is supposed to be about an hour. Are people okay with my continuing? Okay, thank you. We're actually close to the end. Uh, here is what I referred to at the very beginning. Um, there were technical amendments that have already been signed into law by the governor um, a few weeks ago, and Senate Bill 6249 is the technical amendments bill, and almost everything in it, which is not very much, is highly technical. But lo and behold, a beautiful new provision popped up, beautiful from my point of view as a corporate lawyer, that says, Finally and clearly, you can incorporate 
a nonprofit corporation for essentially for any nonprofit purpose, either any charitable nonprofit purpose or any non-charitable nonprofit purpose. Period. And you can have a clause that says, and by the way, we don't intend to assume any power or purpose that requires an agency consent under those other provisions that I referred to. And those are binding, those are conclusive. You know, lawyers aren't dumb. We used to write this stuff in our purpose clause. We used to say we're forming for these, for these purposes, and we used to say we don't intend to have any purpose that triggers an agency's jurisdiction, and that would get ignored. The Department of State would send it back to us and say, well, that's still too general. Please be more specific so that we can determine if you have a business purpose or if you need an agency consent. So we wound up in the same place. So now we have these provisions. Why is this so good? Because incorporation slowed down when you had to go through all this stuff and became expensive as your certificates got amended and rejected or as you, had to, had, as you got sent over to get consents from other agencies. This should improve formation of corporations. This should give you broader purpose clause that you don't have to amend every two to five years so you don't wind up with a 20-page long certificate of incorporation after 10 or 20 years. I've seen certificates of incorporation that have been amended 18 and 20 times over the life of a corporation for reasons like this. That isn't the way corporations should be administered. This actually, in my view, is a profound improvement in New York corporate law. Despite all the other complaints that I make about other parts of the statute, this is a good thing. And it slipped in through technical amendments. I'm just delighted. I don't know where it came from. Uh, now, with all this stuff here, I've been talking about the Attorney General, but we haven't heard really a peep from the Attorney General about related party transactions, the independent de director definitions, etc. Uh, I know that the AG is not ignoring this. Uh, they are working on guidance. Uh, the Bar Association talks to the AG. Probably lots of other people talk to the AG too, but my, my committee talks to the Attorney General staff, and we know that they are working on guidance. Um, we would like them to come out with guidance that's rational. We hope we are sharing these concerns with the Attorney General. We hope the Attorney General recognizes the ambiguities and concerns and drafts useful guidance. We'll see what comes out of the other Charities Bureau. I refer to the bills that are out there. There's plenty of people, you know, raising these concerns with the legislature as well, saying you should amend this, you should amend that. We don't know yet whether the legislature is interested in revisiting these provisions <coughs> so soon after enacting them. I think we should just keep our eyes open and see what moves and what doesn't move uh, in Albany. And then finally, you know, I talked about you know all the things the Bar Association and others have been talking about over the past 10 years. Here's a couple of uh, what I thought were significant ones. This first one is a, a relatively obscure clause that just about every other corporation is allowed to have, except you guys, except New York not-for-profit corps. A clause in your cert of ink that says that directors are not personally liable for simple negligence, we call it, non-intentional uh, breaches of duty, liable to the corporation, that is, because that's who directors owe their duty to. New York business corporations have always had that. Think about that. Business corporations have that protection in New York, not not-for-profits. In Delaware, business and nonprofits have that protection. And so do most other states that have those provisions. If other states have them, they apply them equally to both the business and the nonprofit, but not New York. And, um, and it, my bar association advocated for this for a while. But, you know, it's like the times changed somehow in the 2000s with all these scandals that came out about nonprofits starting in the 90s from United Way through some of the New York scandals like, uh, like the Senator Espada's organization on Long Island, suddenly the attitude changed like, well, this is not responsible, you know, we have to hold your feet to the fire. You directors need to, need to have more of a sense of purpose here. We can't just hand you this protection from liability. That tended to be the reaction. So I'm not sanguine that, that we'll be able to get that one through. But I mention it because I view it as fundamental because it is so widespread and you guys are the outliers. By you guys, I mean New York not-for-profits. And I don't think that's I don't think that's a good way to run a statute, frankly. And then, as I said, agency consents. That, as I said, that's unique to New York. Uh, it has it's frankly of highly dubious value. Uh, it's not just education department. There's a whole laundry list of other agencies, and I deal with many of them doing these processes. And in half the time, at least, the reaction of the agency is, 
why are you writing to me? We don't want to have to deal with this. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not a lot. Um, if you actually read some of the letters you get back when you finally pry the letter out of the agency, the letter, a client actually read this to me on the phone, a new client that came to me and I said, do you have this thing in your certificate? Because if you do, that might affect what we have to do. And the client said, oh yeah, now that you mention it, we do have an agency letter attached to our certificate. And he started reading it to me. He said, oh, but don't worry, it's okay. The agency said our consent is not required. But that's just it. That's not how the Department of State treats it. The Department of State just wants that agency consent and it gets attached to your certificate and get, gets put on file with it and you are stuck with that. So if you amend that particular clause, you have to go back and get that agency's consent. Who's going to say again, but we don't have to consent. And you just do it. So you've heard the, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the cynical from me tonight. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you for letting me share my opinions. I hope I didn't offend anybody by being so frank about some of these things. Maybe as someone as a relative who's an attorney general. I actually have a, an extraordinary degree of respect. Some of, I think, the smartest lawyers around are in the attorney general's office. Uh, but also, I think some of the most opinionated lawyers around are there too as well. Thank you. PowerPoint and also um, Squeaky Wheel Buffalo Media Resources has recorded this session so you can go back and reference it. Um, and also on our YouTube channel you'll find all of our other past training sessions as well. So thank you. We'll be in contact with you. Thank you.